is lecture CC2. In this lecture, we're going to be going over complex biochemistry and the idea of biomolecules. We'll talk about proteins, uh, their constituents, amino acids, and the different structural levels in a protein. We'll go over carbohydrates and their components, monosaccharides, and the idea of disaccharides and polysaccharides. We'll talk about nucleic acids, the component of a nucleotide and how it's assembled into DNA and RNA. We'll go over various kinds of lipids like fatty acids, phospholipids, triglycerides, eicosanoids, and sterols. And then finally, we'll talk about the idea of enzymes, how they catalyze reactions, uh, how enzymes are regulated, and a little bit about the idea of a metabolic pathway. Hi. So last time we talked a little bit about the idea of what makes something alive. And we had made a little list of uh, requirements for something to be alive, things like reproduction and response to the environment and things like that. And then we mentioned that life really doesn't seem to be magic. It seems to come from having the right chemistry, the right kind of biochemistry. So what we're going to be doing today is talking about what kind of molecules are involved in that kind of complex biochemistry. Now, sometimes people don't like this idea because they, they say, well, molecules are just physics. That's chemistry and physics. Molecules interact. We, n we understand those interactions, at least mostly. How can just molecules interacting produce something like a human mind? How can that produce a living thing? With the idea that something as complex as a living thing that shows so many interesting behaviors could not possibly come from a simple system, relatively simple, like chemical interactions. But what we found is that simple things, things obeying simple rules, can actually produce very complex outcomes. And if you're not sure of that, there's lots of ways to show it. Um, take a look at the game of life if you're interested in looking that up. But another thing to think about is just your computer. I mean. Your computer is a series of ones and zeros held in storage that direct the functioning of a large number of relatively simple uh, transistors. It's obviously more complicated than that, but it's still something that humans understand and built, and yet it displays behaviors that are very hard to explain down at the level of individual transistors. So it doesn't seem that difficult to believe that getting the right kind of complex molecules together would allow them to interact in ways that would produce effects that are hard to predict from the individual molecules. This is an idea called emergent properties, the idea that simple things interacting in simple ways can produce complex outcomes. It's related to a lot of interesting things, and it's probably part of how you get the amazing complexity of living things from biochemistry. But in order to get those complex things, you have to have some relatively complex starting points. So for example, your CPU is made of millions and millions of transistors, which are relatively simple little gates, but they're assembled into groups that do much more complicated things. In the same way, while your molecules are made of atoms, which interact in some relatively well understood ways, put enough of those atoms together and you get big complicated biomolecules that do interesting things. And then you put a lot of those together and allow them to interact and you get even more interesting outcomes. So what we're going to be doing right now is looking at some of the complex molecules that are involved in biochemistry. So let's talk first about the idea, let's talk first about the four kinds of biomolecules we're gonna be mentioning today. So the word biomolecules refers to molecules which, relatively complex molecules, which are characteristically found in living systems. So something like water, which is found in all living systems, is not really considered a biomolecule because it's a relatively simple molecule, two hydrogens and an oxygen. But we're gonna be looking at larger molecules and because they're larger and more complex, they can do more subtle things. We usually talk about four major classes of biomolecules. Those are not the only kinds of molecules important in biochemistry, but this set of four classes four groups is a kind of a useful way of thinking about them. So those groups are proteins, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and lipids. So the many of the important molecules that take part in your biochemistry are one of these four categories. Not all but most. Now, of these four categories, three of them, these first three, 
are what we call polymers. A polymer is a larger molecule that's made up of many very similar or identical smaller molecules put together. So for example, a protein is a chain of amino acids. Amino acids are smaller, simpler molecules that when you put enough of them together in the right way, they become a protein. Carbohydrates are assemblies of monosaccharides. And nucleic acids are assemblies of nucleotides. Lipids are not polymers. Uh, in some cases, they have some, some smaller components that are involved, but they don't really meet the characteristics of a polymer. So we're gonna, we'll talk separately about lipids. The units that make up a polymer are monomers. So we could say that a protein is a polymer of amino acid monomers. And a carbohydrate can be a polymer of monosaccharide monomers. And a nucleic acid is a polymer of monomer nu nucleotides. So that's some terminology you might use here. So let's start Let's start with proteins, let's, which, is, which are probably the single most versatile ones, although nucleic acids might, make a, might contest that. So let's talk about what's a protein and how is it put together. All right, to talk about proteins, we need to, talk, we need to start by talking about their monomer, the idea of an amino acid. So here's the basic structure of an amino acid. We have a central carbon attached to a nitrogen with two hydrogens on it, and another carbon with a double bond to an oxygen, and then a oxygen-hydrogen here. This has another hydrogen, and then here I'm going to put something I'm going to label R. We'll get back to that in a second. So we call this an amino acid because this particular structure, the NH2 part, we call an amine group. And this thing back here is another assembly you'll see often in biochemistry. So it's sometimes abbreviated COOH or HOOC. This is known as a carboxyl or carboxylic acid group. So hence the amino acid. This part here, what it, what's labeled R, is a side group. Now there are 20 different amino acids which are used in the human biochemistry. I put a star by the 20 because uh, at least one of them is sometimes modified after it's put in to turn it into what is technically another amino acid. But really, we, most of the time, we talk about 20 different amino acids. What makes amino acids different from each other is this R group. So that can be anything from a single hydrogen, in I believe that's glycine, to large, complex, multi-ring structures in some like phenylalanine. But each amino acid has its own different R group. And the characteristics of that R group change how that amino acid behaves. So some amino acids, determined by their R group, are hydrophilic, meaning that that R group has lots of polar parts that water can form hydrogen bonds to, which means that amino acid will dissolve well in water. Some of them are lipophilic, meaning they are mostly or entirely nonpolar, meaning water will not, not interact well with them. Some of them are charged. Some of them carry positive or negative charge. That makes them extra hydrophilic, and it also means that they will be extra strongly attracted to other amino acids that have the opposite charge, or other things of other sorts that have the opposite charge. Some of them are large, some of them are small. So it's almost like if you imagine, if anybody remembers the uh, toy that's often given to babies, these plas plastic beads that snap together into chains, if you imagine each bead has a piece sticking off of it. Some of them it's very small, some of them it's big, and imagine that some of them have magnets on them arranged at different places on the bead so that if you put it near a bead with the other with magnets that are arranged the opposite way, they'll stick together. 
or in other ways, they'll push each other apart. So imagine that each amino acid is like one of those plastic beads. Now, just like those plastic beads can snap together, different amino acids can be combined. They can stick together, forming what we call a peptide bond. So let me show you how that works. So we'll draw, let's start by drawing two amino acids. We'll label that R1. And over here we will have Here's our second amino acid. So this one has its carboxyl group. This one has its amine group. Now, if you took two amino acids and just threw them at each other randomly, it's unlikely that they would interact in this particular way. But if we can get them to come at each other with the amine group of one and the carboxyl group of another in just the right arrangement, we can get something interesting to happen. We can get this OH part of this amino acid's carboxyl and this hydrogen from this one's amine group. We can get these to come together. We can get these bonds to break and a new bond to form between this oxygen and this hydrogen. If we do that, here's what comes out of it. We'll get carbon. Here's our first amino acid. I'm going to just put a little dot here to represent when I broke this bond, I split. I took those two electrons that were part of it and split them apart. So here's kind of one remaining electron. And here's my other one. When I split that bond, there's one of its remaining electrons. And the OH and the H come together to form. When those split off from those, they recombine to form water. That's handy. Now, these two things with this one unbonded, unpaired electron, those can now come together and share those two electrons to form a new bond. So after, when that happens, we can just represent that by a new covalent bond here. And now these two amino acids are joined into one larger molecule. We've made the beginnings of a protein. It's not a protein yet, but it's on the way. We call this a dehydration reaction because what we did is bring water out of it. And that leaves us with this new bond between these two things. There's a special name for this. We call this particular bond a peptide bond. There's, it's actually just a regular covalent bond. There's nothing magic about that particular bond. But we take note of it because that's the bond that joined these two amino acids together. And if we're ever going to break this protein up, that's the bond we're going to want to break. Actually, we do it by re kind of reversing this process. We bring in a water, break up the water, break that bond, and put it, then split it up like this. And then we have two separate amino acids. But we'll get to that later. So this is how we could take two amino acids and join them into one larger molecule. And now imagine we could bring a third one in over here with its carboxyl group and do the same thing. And then we would have three amino acids together. And we're building them into a chain. Just like taking those plastic beads and snapping them together to make this larger bead chain. A protein is just one or more of these chains of amino acids kind of stuck together and folded up in a way that gives it an overall shape. So let's take a moment to talk about what I mean by folded up. Let's imagine that I have three amino acids. And I'm not going to draw the full backbone of them. We'll just draw it like this. So here's R1, R2, and R3. So three amino acids stuck together. Here's the peptide bonds. Now, these are a little bit flexible. This whole structure can bend and shift a little bit. And let's imagine 
that this particular amino acid carries a positive charge, and this one carries a negative charge. Now, what do you think is going to happen here? Seems to me that these two amino acids are going to tend to attract each other, which is going to make this thing fold up a little bit, as those two try, those two try to get close to each other. That's going to make this chain have a little bend in it. Now, take that idea and now extend this chain to be hundreds of amino acids long. And you can imagine that based on how each amino acid is, each amino acid in the chain, what its characteristics are and what it's close to, or even what's on some other part of the chain over here. So for example, we might have further down the chain, Let's say this is, let's see, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. This is R10 and this is R9. If R10 had a negative charge and R9 had a positive charge, now these are going to attract each other as well, which might cause this to fold up with a little loop in it. And those will tend to stick together. You get the idea. By arranging amino acids in this chain in a particular order, putting the right amino acids in the right places, we can cause this chain to fold up into a particular structure. And that structure, that shape, will have amino acids with different characteristics, big, small, hydrophilic, lipophilic, charged, not charged, sticking out of it in certain places. That gives the whole shape some characteristics. Some parts of it are positive, some are negative, some are nonpolar, some are polar which will cause that big folded up shape to interact with other molecules. And by changing the order of amino acids, you can change what shape it will have. That's what makes proteins so vulnerable. So vulnerable is the wrong word, versatile. A chain of amino acids can be made to fold itself up into almost any shape you want. Those shapes might be a structure. They might be some sort of like tough physical element that isn't very bendable and is very sturdy or they might be something that sticks very well to some other particular thing, like say, another protein on the surface of measles virus, or they might be a machine. They might be something that can sit on a cell and open a little hole and allow ions through, except it has a little lid which closes sometimes. All of those are examples of how proteins can work. Now, some terminology here. The particular sequence of amino acids, it's sort of like making a word with a 20-letter alphabet. The particular order of letters in that large word is what we call the primary structure of the protein. That's the sequence of the amino acids. Those individual areas of this sequence will then tend to fold themselves up into particular useful structures. Like one, one area might fold it up into sort of a spiral that forms a little rod. Another area makes itself into sort of a flat sheet. Those local structures are called secondary structure. And the primary structure causes us to have a particular secondary structure. Then that chain and its local structures folds itself up into an overall structure for the whole chain, which we call tertiary structure. So the whole chain, which is sometimes known as a polypeptide, which just means many peptides, means lots of amino acids stuck together into a chain, folds itself up into a tertiary overall structure. And then that tertiary structure, one chain's tertiary structure might match with another chain's tertiary structure so that they stick together. For example, the protein hemoglobin is actually made of four different amino acid chains, which fold themselves up in such a way that their tertiary structures match and they assemble themselves into a larger protein. That we call quaternary structure. A way of thinking about that might be, I don't know if you've ever done knitting. The, no, it's not really a perfect analogy. I'd have to, I'd have, let me think about it, see if I can come up with a good one. But in any case, by choosing a sequence of amino acids, you'll cause it to fold in certain ways, which gives it all of these different structures, which gives it its function.
the way a protein folds up, its shape and the characteristics on that shape, cause it to be able to do certain things. What? Almost anything. Proteins are versatile. So that's the idea of what a protein is. Hopefully that's clear. I should mention here some of the uh, characteristics of proteins before I go on. Generally, they are large molecules. Uh, exactly how many amino acids you have to have before it's a protein is um, not, not exactly strictly defined. If you've just got one or three amino acids, we don't even usually call that a polypeptide. Once you get into the range of more than three, but less than a few dozen-ish, we call it a polypeptide. Once you get to more than maybe a couple dozen, we start calling it a protein. But there isn't a strict limit in there. So if you hear those terms, polypeptide and protein, a protein is a polypeptide. But if you talk about a polypeptide, you're usually talking about something a little bit too small to be a protein. The other, so these can, and these can be very large. Some proteins can be thousands of amino acids big. So they can go anywhere from a couple dozen amino acids to thousands. They can, they're some of the, some of the largest molecules in the, in the body. And in terms of their characteristics, most proteins that you see in human biochemistry are mostly hydrophilic, not all. So the, many of them will have, most of them will have at least some parts that are hydrophilic, but some of the, many of them will have some portions which are lipophilic. And there's several reasons for that. Uh, we'll talk about later how that might help them fit into a cell membrane. It might also be that if you've got a protein meant to carry another lipophilic molecule, it needs to have a lipophilic area where that molecule can stick to it. But so proteins are usually large and usually at least partially hydrophilic. So just a few things for you to know. We're going to now go on to our next category of biomolecules, which is carbohydrates. All right, let's talk about carbs. So carbohydrates are another kind of biomolecule. Usually the, their chemical formula is something like this. So some number of carbons, about the same number of oxygens, and about twice that number of hydrogens. For example, glucose is C6H12O6. Six carbons, six oxygens, and 12 hydrogens. Now, we mentioned that, carbohy that carbohydrates can be polymers, but let's first talk about these simpler ones, which are totally valid molecules of their own, which we call monosaccharides. Monosaccharides. Mono meaning single or alone or one. Saccharide meaning sugar, so a simple sugar. Uh, there's lots of different ways these can, that these can be, but we're going to talk mostly about two groups of them, the, some six carbon monosaccharides and a couple of five carbon ones. Usually, and the way they're usually built, these molecules are arranged with a ring with stuff sticking off of it. So for example, let's take a look at glucose. Glucose looks like this. The basic structure is five carbons and an oxygen in a ring. One of those carbons has another carbon sticking off of it. So here's our six carbons, one of our oxygens. Then most of these carbons now have an OH. This, by the way, in case it comes up again, just like the name for NH2 is an amine, the OH is called a hydroxyl. Notice it's very polar. Remember we talked in one of the previous lectures about how having all of these hydroxyls on here, these polar groups, makes glucose nice and hydrophilic, interacts well with water. Remember carbon forms four bonds, so here we've got a bond to an oxygen, bond to a carbon, bond to an oxygen hydrogen, and bond to a hydrogen. So over here we'll have another one of these. So each of the carbons in this part of the ring has a hydroxyl and a hydrogen on it. This carbon just has a hydrogen. This one has two hydrogens and a hydroxyl. So that is glucose. 
this uh, the simplest the simple six carbon sugar glucose, pretty much the basic fuel for uh, both aerobic and anaerobic metabolism. It's one of the main molecules that our body uses for energy. So of the six carbon ones, we've got glucose. There are two others that are most important in human biochemistry. One called galactose. The only difference between glucose and galactose is that in galactose, the direction of these is reversed. The OH is up and the H is down in the ring. That doesn't, the chemical formula isn't different at all. The structure is slightly different. It has a very slightly different shape, but having that OH be up here rather than down here causes galactose to behave a little differently, which is kind of interesting. Another, another one that we have is, I'll have to redraw it, fructose. I haven't drawn fructose very often, so let me make, refer to my little sheet here. Fructose has only four carbons in the main ring. Here's carbon number five. And over here is carbon number six. So it has two of its carbons sticking off the ring rather than just one for glucose and galactose. And the other ones over here have their OHs. On them. This one goes up. Does it? No, other way around, sorry. I will not ask you to draw any of these. So that is what fructose looks like. Same, again, same, same chemical formula, I think, uh, but a little bit different structure. So those are the three six-carbon monosaccharides that, we, that you need to know about. And you don't need to know their structures. I'm just showing you in case it's interesting to you. The two five-carbon monosaccharides that we'll mention are ribose and deoxyribose. I'm not going to draw them in detail. I'm going to leave off some of the some of the details, but their basic structure looks like this. And the main difference between them is whether this carbon has two H's, in which case it's deoxyribose, or if one of them is an OH, in which case it's ribose. That's really the only difference between them. But that small difference, that slight shape difference, makes a difference in how they behave. These two sugars are primarily used in building nucleotides, which are part of nucleic acids. And one of the big differences between DNA and RNA, if you've heard of them, is that DNA uses the deoxyribose sugar and RNA uses the ribose sugar. That small structural change makes a difference in how they assemble themselves. Kind of interesting. Anyway, but. We're not going to talk very much about these except in the context of nucleic acids. So there's our monosaccharides, the building blocks of, the, of any larger carbohydrate. And these are useful on their own. Glucose is our main fuel. But we, you, we're going to see them often in larger structures. We also can see them in disaccharides. If you look at the name, disaccharides, di, double, so two, two sugars. This is two monosaccharides stuck together. This is how we find a lot of the uh, carbohydrates in our food. Not all, but many. So there are three that are important for us. There's sucrose, which is a glucose stuck to a glucose, two glucoses bound together. This is table sugar. If you, if you buy granulated sugar at the store, or powdered sugar, or confectioner sugar, or cane sugar, or beet sugar, that's sucrose. You're getting, sorry, I'm wrong about this. It's a glucose and a fructose. My apologies, I was incorrect on that. Another one is lactose, 
which is a glucose and a galactose stuck together. Lactose is milk sugar, the sugar found in mammal milk. Uh, some of you may be lactose intolerant. Some of the others are you, of you are lactose tolerant. The difference between them is whether you make the enzyme needed to break up glucose and galactose. Um, e pretty much everybody makes that before they're about five years old. But after we wean, after humans stop nursing, the most typical arrangement is that we stop making the enzyme needed to do this. But some people keep making it and are able to digest lactose even as adults. We'll talk about that a little more later in the class. The third disaccharide you need to know about is maltose, which is glucose to glucose. Just two glucoses stuck together. Um, yeah, we'll talk about it more later too. So those are the three disaccharides you should know about. Now let's finish this up. What if we get more than two? Then we get into the larger category of polysaccharides. Poly meaning many, so many sugars. We're going to talk about two of those that are interesting for human biochemistry and then some that are interesting for other reasons. So starch, also known as amylose, is many glucoses bound together. So in starch is just lots of glucose molecules sort of stuck together into sort of a branching network. This is how plants store their glucose when they've made it and are keeping it for later use as energy. So when plants make glucose, they then build it into starch to hold onto it. And then later when they need glucose, they can break off pieces of glucose and use that for fuel. Glycogen is also many glucoses. It's similar to starch. The structure is a little bit different. It branches a little more. But this is how animal cells store glucose. So for example, when your body has more blood glucose than you need, it's taken up by the liver, muscle, and fat cells. And especially in the liver and muscle cells, it's built into larger structures of glycogen, which is how they store that glucose. And then later, inside your muscle cells, you can break up the glycogen and use the glucose. And from your liver, you can break up the glycogen and release it into the blood to add sugar back into the blood so other organs can use it. So this is just two ways of storing glucose. Your body also has the right enzymes to break these up. You can break up your own glycogen and you can break up the starch you get from plants. So for example, if you enjoy potatoes, potatoes are mostly starch. And when you eat a potato, there are starch digesting enzymes, we'll talk about those toward the end of the class, that break up that large glucose polymer into smaller pieces, specifically maltoses, two glucose pieces, which are then further broken up later in the digestive tract. So there's our idea of polysaccharides that we can digest. But there's some more. There's one in particular I want to mention. Cellulose is also a glucose polymer. Just like starch and glycogen, it's a glucose polymer. But the glucoses in cellulose are bound together in a slightly different way. The bond that's sticking them together is kind of upside down. Because of that, first of all, the glucoses arrange themselves in more orderly rows and form a sturdier structure. Cellulose is glucose put together as almost more as bricks than anything else, and it makes relatively rigid structures that plants use to make their cell walls. They're relatively stiff cell walls, unlike animal cells, which have these flexible membranes. Plant cells also have flexible membranes, but they usually encase them in a sturdier cell wall made of glucose, cellulose. So cellulose is why plants are a little bit stiff or crispy. Now, when humans eat cellulose, you can take it into your mouth, you can grind it up with your teeth, but all you're doing then is breaking it into pieces. You're not actually breaking many of the glucoses apart. And your digestive enzymes can't break down the, the bond in cellulose. You can break down the bond between glucose in starch and glycogen, but the one in cellulose, which is reversed, 
your enzymes can't do anything with it. So we cannot break down cellulose and we can't digest it, we can't absorb it, we can't use it. It's still not a bad thing to have when you talk about fiber in foods, a lot of that is cellulose and it has some benefits, but not as a digestible product. In fact, to the best of my knowledge, no animals actually have at least very much of the enzyme needed to digest cellulose. Even animals that do eat things like eat things that contain a lot of cellulose, like for example, termites eating wood or cows or sheep eating grass, have to rely on internal symbiotic organisms to digest that for them. Cows have bacteria in some of their digestive tract that breaks down the cellulose for them. Termites house protists in their digestive tract, which can break down cellulose. Um, I believe some animals have a very small amount of the enzyme needed to digest it, but effectively animals generally can't digest cellulose on their own. The ones that eat a lot of it have other things that live inside them that do the job for them, which is kind of interesting too. And actually, one more, chitin, which is the stuff that makes up arthropod exoskeletons, uh, crabs, insects, spiders, lobsters, and the cell walls in fungus, which gives it kind of that slightly tough leathery texture. Those are made of chitin, which is a polymer of a modification of glucose that makes it a little more flexible, a little bit softer. So it's just, that's also a, mostly a glucose polymer. So those are some examples of polysaccharides, larger glucose polymers. All right, that pretty much covers it for carbohydrates. So our next one, which will be in the next section of this lecture, is nucleic acids.